Uh, hi, everyone. My name is James Piacentini. I'm here with Winnie Shen and Tyler Matteo from your Department of City Planning. We're really excited to share the Equitable Development Data Explorer, EDDE, with you today. Um, before we jump in, I quickly want to thank Open Data Week and NYC School of Data for having us and the New York chapter of the Internet Society for their technical support in recording these sessions. Um, so before we jump in, just a quick little bit of background on GCP. Um, most of you probably know that uh, we are the city's primary land use agency, and we work primarily on designing and implementing physical and socioeconomic frameworks for city development. Uh, essentially, we do zoning. Um, a couple of our key data tools are listed here, um, and our digital services team manages over 15 public-facing tools, applications, and data portals that are vital to New York City's planning and development process, and we rely on all the other divisions of our agency to provide us the expertise um, to build those tools. Um, our newest and most exciting tool launched last year is EDDE. So what is EDDE? The Equitable Development Data Explorer is an interactive, data-driven, data-driven web-based resource that equips New Yorkers with information to navigate challenging conversations around housing affordability, displacement, and racial equity in our city. It's a joint project between New York City Department of City Planning and the Department of Housing Preservation and Development. Uh, it is comprised of two main components. The Community Data Portal, which provides easy access to a wide range of demographic, housing, and quality of life data to inform public discussions about racial equity planning in our, for our fairer city. And the dis Displacement Risk Map, which illustrates the level of risk residents may face for being unable to stay in their homes or neighborhood. This map combines data about housing and demographics to indicate the level of displacement risk in different neighborhoods as compared to each other. EDDE combines over 200,000 data points across dozens of indicators from a wide variety of federal, state, and city data sources. These are some of those listed here. Uh, these are put together by subject matter experts across both our agencies and public advocates and organized and processed by our incredible data engineering team. We also provide yearly updates to EDDE. Um, I'm excited to share that this year's updates will be live next month, April 2023. Um, and if you want to stay up to date on that, please sign up um, on our contacts page for um, our newsletter. We'll send you out info when that goes live. So why did we build EDDE? Um, I will hand it off to Winnie to share that slide. So what was the impetus for EDE or EDI? Because I find EDE is too many of the same sounding letters to say one after another. Um, so it was required by Local Law 78 of 2021, which was developed out of advocacy by the Racial Impact Study Coalition, or RISC. And some members of that group include NHC, Association for Neighborhood Housing Development, um, Regional Plan Association, and MATS, which is a bunch of groups, a bunch of housing advocate groups that some folks in this room might be familiar with, and public advocate Jamani Williams, the Center of Major Planning Decisions and Racial Equity. So the Equal Development Data Explorer helps advance the city's work to promote fair housing and equal development across the five boroughs, as outlined in the city's fair housing plan, which is called Where We Live NYC, which was published by HPD a few years back. Um, so these tools are really a product of a close collaboration with community partners and electeds. To develop this tool, we also work with a range of stakeholders aside from risks, such as community boards and land use applicants. We also have public hearings. Um, so there's just really a wide range of stakeholders that we talk to. So the EDE um, helps address a gap in our current land use application process is our environmental review does not require discussion of data relevant to evaluating racial equity impacts. So we like sharing this timeline um, because we want to illustrate how short it was for our really hardworking data engineer to develop this tool. The legislation was passed in June of 2021, and we had a requirement for this tool to be launched by April of 2022. So in less than a year, we had a fully working interactive website with all these data indicators and all these maps that had to be published within that time frame. And then about two months after we had to get the racial equity reports form working and launched so that um, applications that were coming in at that point could actually use it to fulfill that legislative requirement. Super tight timeline, a lot of stakeholders engaged, a lot of data flying around. It was a really hectic process. Um, so that's just to illustrate, there's like anything you see in this tool, you're like, why didn't they include these things? It's like, well, you know, we were, it was a short, it was a short timeline. So we're hoping now that we have the EDI tool and now we have racial equity reports that they can provide planners and communities with reliable shared data about New York City and its neighborhoods and to help facilitate this discourse around neighborhood change and displacement pressures. So the idea is like, okay, before there was all these scattered data sets for anyone here who's ever worked with NYC Open Data Portal, like, yes, it's really great, but it's like really annoying to have to download like HPD data, DOMNH data, and like NYCHA data. But now this 
tool helps aggregate all those sources in one place. It also shows how statistically reliable that is, as well as it's aggregated by race and ethnicity. And also, one of my favorite metaphors to describe this is that it ensures when we're shouting at each other, we're all shouting at each other in the same room, at least. We're all able to look at the same exact data. And that ensures like very high quality and it's prepared by our, our lovely engineers. So a little bit more about um, racial equity reports. So we won't touch on them too much. So they're only required for a certain land use application. They were filed started from June 1st, 2022. So they're a very new requirement for a land use process. And it's intended to be a separate document from the very technical zoning language focused applications that if anyone's ever gone onto like our zoning portal and try to read like a land use application, it's like sort of hard for most people to understand. So an RER is meant to be, you get a really quick snapshot of what the project is about and the surrounding project area. And all of the data that is quoted in an RER is pulled from EDE. So that's where all that data is coming from. And also that it's meant to help ground the project area and the actual context of the area based on um, current data that we're pulling. Um, the one thing I will note is the RER does not include any predictions, determinations, or findings. So that's how it differs from our otherwise like environmental assessment statements, which do have predictions. So it's more of a just a current framework of a descriptive, it's a descriptive document of what the current project area looks like and how that project, um, proposed project might fit into it. So here's some information about what exactly is goes inside an RER in case you've never had the privilege of reading one. Um, though they're all public, um, you can go on Zillow and like if a project has an RER, you can read it. So there is a lot of data. Um, this is a snapshot of one part of a community profile summary, which is something you can download from EDE. Um, and it has interpretive statements. So like if you don't know how to read a bar chart, it like helps you. And it shows you the project area, um, the neighborhood, compared with the borough and the city and breaks that down by race where possible. Um, also, there is a displacement risk map as part of EDE, which is a really cool thing. Um, and the in RER, they have to include a snapshot of the displacement risk map along with where about the project location sits, along with the, all the tables that are on EDE. So when you open RER and you're like, why is this 60 pages? It's mostly just table. It's really not that long. Um, and on top of that, there's also um, information that is specific to that project itself. So if there's a residential project, it will show a breakdown based on the um, estimated number of units of affordability by AMI band. And if this is a fully affordable project that I'm showing here. If it wasn't, it would also show that, um, estimated rents and eligible income for the non-income restricted units as well, which I think is really cool because it often shows how AMI and market rate rents are very similar or very different in certain communities. Um, so this is really interesting. It also shows the number of jobs and estimated construction jobs as well. And, and there's also a narrative portion of it where if the applicant has to talk about how their project um, fur affirmatively furthers a New York City's fair housing goals as outlined by where we live, NYC. All right, and about has back to Jane. So how did we design ED? Uh, well, first off, the credit goes to our design team, Natasha Troll and Jasmine Pingala, who could not be here today. Um, they have left me in charge of showing off their incredible work, so I'm going to do the best I can. Um, the application design process followed a people-to-products approach. Uh, we started with research and discovery, moved to ideation, lo-fi designs. The ideation process eventually brings us to high-fidelity mock-ups and interactive prototypes. And once we had a complete high-fidelity design, we work on a handoff, a uh, set of handoff documentation that we can hand to our engineers so that they'll understand and how to implement that. Um, and we work with them throughout that process until we launch the MVP or the minimum viable product. That's kind of like the, think of it, the 1.0 version. Post-launch, we review, research, and develop uh, ongoing improvements, which uh, we have been updating throughout the latter half of last year and into this year. Um, when it came to research, we started with the basic requirements. Uh, we had to think about how to visualize over 60 different unique uh, data indicators uh, across multiple scales and timeframes. These data would also be filterable by race and ethnicity. Um, and so we really wanted to understand who our users would be to help us help inform how we wanted to organize this data. Um, as part of that, we developed what are called proto personas um, and envision user stories for them. So we kind of try to understand who might want to use this data, how they might want to use that. Uh, so for example, uh, as a member of the public, uh, I might want to compare vulnerabilities in my neighborhood to others in a city uh, in order to understand factors that lead to displacement. As a community advocate, uh, I might want to view and access intelligible data related to racial and ethnic disparities, social, economic, and housing conditions. 
in order to support my work. As a ULIP applicant, uh, I might, or a property owner, uh, submitting a land use review application, I want a tool that allows me to generate and export data for racial equity reflux, the requirement. But I can attach that to my application with a statement about how my proposed projects relates to the citywide goals for bare housing, as, as we uh, described earlier. We also conducted secondary research by reviewing existing web maps and tools um, for UI, for data re uh, representation, for uh, aesthetics. Um, and we thought about how these established web design principles uh, could in inform how we organize our many, many data points. From here, we move on to the ideation phase. Uh, we start with sketches and mock-ups and explore layout as well as user flows and interactions. We use these to get early feedback from our subject matter experts and other project partners, as well as our engineering team. These sketches eventually develop into what are called low-fire mid-fidelity wire flows, where we're adding new levels of detail and prototyping interactivity, starting to lay out buttons, colors, interactions, things like that, uh, such as which buttons will lead to which maps, what happens when users perform certain actions, etc. Uh, we fine tune our design language and user affordances to make sure that the app is user friendly. As we approach high fidelity, we develop a cohesive design language and style guide. This includes reusable components, custom variants, uh, and we make sure to adhere to accessibility best practices so that our tools are available to the widest breadth of users. It's really important to us as developers of public facing tools that these are as easily accessible to everyone as possible. Uh, this eventually leads our mocked ups to turn into the real thing. We develop our prototypes and wireframes for both web view and mobile view with various tablets and screen size breakpoint between so that again, no matter what device you're on, you can enjoy the full functionality of the app. Once we have that complete design, as I said, we develop what are called handoff documents for our engineering team. Here you can see some of that where we'll have very specific details around sizing, spacing, color palettes, which elements go where, um, and all that documented in that, in that file. Um, this also documents adjustments along the way as we iterate through the, through the build phase. Eventually, this leads to the launch of the MVP, EDDE 1.0, in April of last year. After launch, the design team and product team reflect on lessons learned and engage with users to see what's working and what isn't. We conducted usability tests with public advocates and professional users. We reviewed user analytics to see which parts of the app are being used and in what ways. And we synthesized our findings into a new round of product improvement uh, to, to develop insights and uh, implement those improvements. We returned to EDDU late last year to implement some of those, such as improved data UI, additional geographic boundaries, and increasing user affordance through contextual labels. We released 1.1 last year, as I said, and we're continuing to explore additional improvements throughout this year and future. Um, you know, we're really excited that this tool has launched and it's, it's one of our um, kind of most exciting products that launched in a, in a while. Um, so all of that is great. And as a product person, as a designer, I really love it. As data people, most of you are probably wondering how we actually manage to convert over 200,000 data points into a functional platform like this. And how we actually built PD. So I'm going to hand that off to Tyler to explain some of the sophisticated engineering behind how this actually came. Great. So um, before I jump into this, um, I want to ask, like, I just try to hand, see here, that I have, like, any sort of web or front-end development or software engineering. Uh, cool. What about just, like, any type of, like, coding or anything for school work? All right. That's actually cool. All right. So, uh, I'm going to jump into how we went about uh, building EDD. So just to set the stage a little bit, uh, EDDG was built internally by the open source engineering team um, within digital services at the Department of City Planning. Uh, it was built by a team of three engineers uh, in an initial so build phase of three months. So this is kind of like the uh, January to like very early April of that timeline you saw earlier um, by this team of three engineers. Fortunately, there's a couple more of us these days, but at the time, that was the size of the team. Uh, we knew going in as we wanted to use open source libraries and frameworks uh, for the industry standard tools that help us build, um, you know, effective solutions quickly, uh, as with any of our other products. Uh, 
again, as just sort of table stakes, we knew we wanted this website to be performant, responsive on different devices, and of course, accessible to folks um, with all sorts of um, special needs. Um, and lastly, you know, going into this project, we knew it was kind of clear to us that we would have to get started building this thing like, while we were still receiving a lot of data that we were going to have to show. So that kind of came down to working on um, kind of we're working with that data engineer team about kind of what the data would look like, even if we didn't have all the file data up front. So as an engineering team, uh, just kind of thinking about like, what were our sort of like input? What were we kind of like starting with to work on this project? So um, up front, we knew the data for all these different indicators and things that you've heard about. We knew we'd be getting that data in sort of a pre-aggregated um, or kind of like compiled uh, machine readable um, data format from our wonderful um, data engineering team at DCP. I think like some of them are here. Uh, so we knew we would have that. Um, we knew we would be leveraging other open data sets, um, mainly for things like uh, geography is for rendering on maps and things like that. We knew we'd be um, getting those Figma mockups that James showed as to sort of guide how we're building um, the front end experience. Um, and lastly, we knew we'd be working uh, closely with various teams um, to sort of spec out how the copy and label the metadata um, and how all this data would be like organized within the interface. So first kind of step here, I want to talk about the, like the processing, the processing of the data. So, you know, given that like we knew how we had to be getting this data, like what were the challenges and what, what was kind of our side of the fence for getting this data into the application. So in our case, we were starting with like a set of, of um, sort of flat CSV files with like accompanying data dictionaries. And we knew that we wanted to take that data and convert it into um, like static structured JSON that um, kind of lended itself well to like the overall information architecture of the application we were trying to build. Um, so that like the Figma mockups and stuff like that, it was that. Um, we knew that we wanted to sort of encode a lot of the kind of like metadata and copy and things like that found for the various data points um, into that outputted JSON. Um, we knew we would be get, putting this data up in some sort of like S3 compatible cloud storage, um, accessing it from that. Uh, in the application. Uh, and finally, we knew we wanted to structure the JSON um, based on things like the geography that the data apply to, um, the different categories of data that you'll see like reflected in the interface, as well as like the different population um, groups that the application shows um, for looking at things by like different um, racial and Hispanic origin uh, breakdowns. So just that that's like a lot of kind of vague descriptions of what it looks like. So what 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 like what did we actually do with the data? So a lot of the data we received looks kind of something like you see here, it's like a flat sort of like tabular representation of all the data, you know, maybe it's all the demographic data for every district um, in one file, another file demographic data for every borough and so on. So we took this data and what we kind of put it into is something that looks a little more like what you see here. So like um what we kind of were shooting for here is like something that uh, includes everything that we need to sort of like render out this interface. So you see here, like the data are kind of organized um, in kind of more of like a nested structure. Any like front end engineer will know that like you like having these little like nested lists that we can iterate through. Um, you see things like labels and and um, kind of the for characteristics of the data that you know will influence like how the UI is built. We wanted to kind of have all of that here so that we weren't like fielding it into the actual like front end itself, uh, which can get pretty, um, you know, messy over time. Um, so actually like stepping in to build this application um, is why that, so we knew we needed some sort of like front end framework for structuring this kind of thing. Um, we knew we wanted the shareable link. So we wanted people to be able to visit the page for like their community district and copy and paste um, their URL out of out of the browser and be able to share it with someone. That person would see the same data, keep it the same link. Um, we knew we would have to have some sort of like support for doing interactive uh, maps. Uh, and we knew that we were going to work with this, the static JSON file that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then lastly, we knew that we wanted to leverage uh, kind of like a common like front end architecture, especially nowadays uh, known as static site generation. And some of that would help with like the performance of the website. Um, so talk a little bit more about 
we'll pop that site, site generation. So what we're talking about here is kind of taking advantage of the fact that like we knew that we would have this data ahead of time. Um, we could kind of process it how we wanted and, you know, spin up all this, this sort of like structured data that we could update whenever we needed to. So a lot of the data um, that you're going to actually see in the application is going to look from like some kind of version of this page that we see here would be a, these sort of like sets of tables. So this was kind of what we were working with to be able to say, okay, well, we know like kind of given the kind of the structure of the data, what we're working with, essentially when we build our site, so when we make a change and want to publish a new kind of version of the site, uh, whether that's because, you know, there's a copy change or we have a new version of the data set or something like that. Effectively, what it's doing is sitting out about 1,500 versions of this page that you see here with the different data sets. Uh, what this means is that when somebody um, visits the page, you know, their, their browser and then it's loading the UI and then they're seeing loading spinners to the, make it another round trip to a server somewhere to put out all the data. Uh, they're actually getting like a fully rendered out uh, web page. Uh, what this means for our users is that uh, they see a very fast experience. So what you'll see here on the right is it's like a report from a tool called Lighthouse that some folks might be familiar with. Uh, it's a tool we use for measuring different like performance metrics on our websites. Um, we're taking advantage of that structured JSON. Uh, this is especially ideal and like especially noticeable for folks that are, might be working on slower internet speed, which is a topic that you know comes up a lot. Um, finally, like as a result of this, we ended up kind of getting through this whole project without having to build any learning spinners, which is exciting. Um, so lastly, I just want to quickly talk about like the kind of like tech stack that we worked with here. So um, data processing, you know, probably won't be surprised to a lot of folks here that we uh, were doing a lot of that in Python with um, the library called Canvas to kind of, you know, ingest all that data and generate that output that we wanted. Um, as far as front end, you know, we were building this in TypeScript, um, it React and sort of our front end JavaScript framework of choice. Um, use a component uh, library called Chakra it helped us, especially on like this timeline we were on to give us like components we knew we would need. Um, finally, up on a, a framework called Next.js um, kind of gave us a toolkit for doing that static site generation. And lastly, um, for a lot of the interactive kind of like mapping stuff you're going to see, uh, a lot of that relies on a library um, called DeckGL that actually was originally came out of Uber, has since been picked up by like a um, and the open source uh, foundation, um, and Mapbox's um, JavaScript's like library. And lastly, it is open source, so we'll go here and you can look at our code. Uh -huh. So I think with that, we're going to open up QA. Or any questions about any of that? Sorry, did you show it again? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Not just for me either. Um, how many other data sets that throw are under LIDAS are open data themselves and are? Yeah. Um, uh, that's a good question for our data engineering team. So I can speak to like uh, for like the maps, especially that you'll see in the application that have like, you know, the same open data sets for like the Kaplan districts, you know, to get the polygons for like Kaplan districts, Trumas or whatever. Um, so all of those, all of those data sets are open either, either uh, you want to see open data or like from the Census Bureau or whatever. Um, a lot of the data are from um, the Census Bureau itself. So those are, those are open through them. Um, I think some of the other data sets um, for sort of more kind of like ad hoc gathering from other city agencies. Yeah, I think uh, a majority of them are almost ad hoc. Yeah, uh, uh, from like, uh, I think some of them are open source, um, but uh, a lot of them were, were really just ad hoc. Like asking if we need this data provided for us, they type them on process. So they would allow the filing data. I think they're in table. In the site, where we at the top level, it's the source. Sometimes, of course, might just say that. But I'm not sure the detail of the budget of the Department of Education data, but if we're getting like test score percentage broken down by rate, broken down by geographic area, I just don't think they're putting that on open data. Uh, but like a lot of these projects and products, 
we are effectively publishing their data by fraud threats and making it open. So uh, even if the form leaked data them isn't available, the aggregation of these equipment to putting that out will essentially public any data for the department. Why wouldn't and we do have on the site there is a methods and sources page that yeah includes like the data dictionary and has a, a pretty extensive breakdown of um where all the data came from, what's uh, the different agencies and some description of that, like how some of these models for the displacements were built. So um there's a pretty good amount of information that might help figure out which data sources are available to publish it as well. And anything that is on the site on EV is downloadable. So UV itself is is fully public on that data is available for anyone. Uh, sorry, sorry, the phone and it's the phone, uh, those that insights that are aggregated, they all can go off and get updated. Yeah, so they're actually like effectively like all those pages like are kind of re rendered out or like regenerated whenever we release a new version of the app or of the site. Um, like whenever we actually like make a change and you know goes through code review and we decide to send it live, um, even though a lot of times like the actual underlying data might not be changing and it'll, it'll flip from a cache or whatever. Um, but in terms of the actual data changing, um, uh, we are do we, uh, James mentioned this, like we have a, a new data release coming up in this half. And I think as part of the legislation, it's like at least annually. Yeah. So we'll get like a new year of the data. Um, and, uh, this happened like shortly after the release, but not so much less and less, but, um, you know, Following the initial release, like there was some times where we would have little tweaks to like the copy and things like that. So that would trigger that too. Um, but going forward, it's more kind of like where we get these new like annual data updates. Um, can you speak to, uh, so you talked about local law of uh, uh, 70 years. Um, does that require that every development just about that they are in some way contributing? their housing. So um, rich like your affords are only required for certain land use applications that like trigger specific thresholds. Like for example, with like the most common project pipe that we see triggering an, an RER is one that will increase permitted residential zoning square footage by like 50,000 square feet, which is that like 50 units or so roughly. Um, so like slightly larger residential projects, for example. And in the, that particular section of like section four, where they just have to outline um, how exactly their project fits within where we live. So there is an example of like, let's say if the project just doesn't contribute to any of our fair housing goals, they would just leave that section blank and they would just say this project is not a firmly further New York City's fair housing goals. And that is a perfectly valid way of filling out that section. Um, for projects that have housing, um, most of the where we live goals that HPD outlines, um, they talk about building more housing. So like by being a residential project, they can talk about at least one of the where we live goals and how it fits into them. So, so it can be anything. Um, at least for like for a residential project, like it could be like um, there are. Do you want to go to the appendix slide? Like all the way at the end. Keep going. Next one. So these are the where we live goals and before the HPD. Um, and they and they got these goals like by working with community organizations. There's like a lot of stakeholder engagement to get these. They did not come up with them themselves. But they're talking about. Like some common ones are like preserving affordable housing and prevent displacements. So that's one I see a lot in racial entry reports. So they talk about if they're preserving affordable housing, they'll be able to um, address how that project fits under goal three. Um, because of a lot of new development or all like ADA compliant housing, they can talk about how it fits under goal six for creating more independent integrated living options for people with disabilities. Um, so yeah, and just like most of the projects are saying now, at least for housing, like they can talk about this in some way. If it's like a fully commercial project, it will harder to fit into this. And and does it carry weights? Like how much you guys are achieving these these uh, requests, right? Um, so what happens is the project, um, the applicant submits a racial equity report. Um, I'm the one that reviews them and I just make sure all the data they're quoting is accurate and they're not making any out of scope statements. So like we're solving the housing crisis, that's out of scope. So I would get rid of that, obviously. Um, but basically what happens is that it's meant to provide additional context for the overall land use application. Because like I mentioned before, our current environmental review process doesn't require the applicant to address um, like racial ethnic disparities. And this is one avenue for the applicant to actually go into that. Um, so this is just to provide like a starting point for this conversation about how to 
center racial equity in our planning and land use actions. And like, uh, the, we have another project um, that we refer to as the applicant portal. It's just like another website that we manage that um, applicants that are going through this process, it's just like a web portal for them to go through and provide us their information. Um, and a lot of it is them, you know, giving us details about about the project and a, a kind of smaller, like, um, the smaller like project of this this triggered for my team was making some updates to that application so that you know based on certain inputs it would just flag to the user hey you have to also supply this this um this report and that's how it would get to the way all right thank you this was really great um but is there any is there any sort of um user user tracking or any sort of information about how this photo tool is being used out of the movies yeah yeah so we have um like a couple of different analytics, uh, web analytics will be used um, really on all of our applications um, to like see you know what folks are interacting with, um, what what you know we could figure out like uh, kind of like you that they would your thing. We could figure out like what neighborhoods folks are interested in um, and stuff like that. We um, also I think like we'll do some sort of more like qualitative stuff. I think that's like part of uh, folks are interested in, in maybe helping with that sort of thing. Like that's a great. Um, you know, we'll be great to sign up for our newsletter and, and possibly involved with that. But we do do, yeah, like what they know what it is. I think one more thing and then yeah. we'll give it a workshop. Um, I was wondering how it's deciding what indicators you can use for some of the things that have been in fact like displacement or and there's a whole development that I can imagine those pink topics where it's easy to disagree with them, or one that is bigger than dollar, or something like that. Yeah, so the legislation actually specifically requires like those five categories that we'll see later when we demo the tool and actually goes into pretty specific detail about what type of data points they want to see within those five categories. Um, so definitely our starting point of like meeting our legislative minimum. But then we also have data points on top of that. So there's a working group of like, us over at city planning at HPD and along with the members of BRINCE, the Racial Impact Study Coalition, where we're all talking about what kind of data points you want to see and incorporate in the tool. I we're really focused on things that are like measurable, like quantitative data points. So obviously, like it's hard to capture like lived experiences and data. So we we're really focused on areas that crowd data that exists and that could be like put onto a floor fence map. So those are sort of our bounds. And of course, like like I mentioned, this tool is built under a short timeline, and we're currently going through a data update, and like we're definitely excited to maybe add more data points or like building out some more features. So it's like a starting point for us as well. We have any feedback? I think we have a feedback form. In there. Yeah, there's a, a contact form as well as left. You can sign up for a like newsletter list on that page sheet. Yeah, so the legislation was our minimum and then we had working groups talking about what else you want to add. That's possible. Cool. What's up in yeah. I'm going to do a very short demo of our tool to show what kind of data story you can tell using it. And then we are going to make you all gather into groups um, and to find out some cool stories about neighborhoods in New York City. Um, so for this example, I'm going to use Flushing. And I grew up there and I have very fond memories of it. Um, so for example, as you can see, these are the five categories. I mentioned that these are recorded in the legislation. Um, so you can go into that household economic security tab and you can scroll all the way here. And up here, you can see how you can um, get all of these numbers disaggregated by specific racial and ethnic groups. Um, so this is a really fun one. This is household by AMI ban and AMI by like HUD income limits. It does not actually mean area median income. Um, so you can see for flushing, for example, a lot of households, um, you see like about, I don't know, my math isn't best, about 40%, let's say, are in this between 30 to 50% AMI. Um, and then there's like a little less up here in the more higher income thresholds. So that's an interesting number to note. So you can go over to like housing production, which is where we have data that we get from HPD. And you can see the amount of um, development that's happening in those AMI bands is quite low. Um, zero, in fact, for zero to 30% AMI, which is like maybe alarming if you're a council member in that area who says that you advocate for affordable housing. And you look at this number and you're like, we're not building housing to meet our community needs. Um, of course, all housing um, is important for, you know, meeting our housing crisis, but this is just interesting data points to think about when you maybe have a land use application on your desk and you're maybe not approving that land use application as a council member. Um, so that's like a very short example of like things you can do with it. Um, hopefully that is enough. And then of course, wait, let me show you where we can. And this is my little download data button that you can download and see cool thing. And method and sources for all of our methodology. Oh, and the last thing I'll show, that's 
July, and this one is fun, is the displacement risk map, which looks like this. And this is broken down by NTA, so a little smaller geography than the community data one. Okay, with that very quick overview, I trust you all to find, find groups, so if your peers around you, we're going to give this like 10 minutes? 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Um, and we'll just ask you to pick out a neighborhood you, know, you live in. You could be this one, Long Island City, or one that you work in, or you live in. Find a cool little fact about it, and we're going to have you all share back in the big group. All right, good luck. Um, all right, everyone, I think we're going to um, jump back in as a group. Uh, we'd love to hear um, about what you all talked about and uh, what you uh, dove into and, and discovered uh, working with staff. So what we'd love to do is maybe go group by group. I think there's about eight groups and just, um, you know, let us know, I guess, your name and where you looked, what geography you looked at, um, what type of stuff you were looking for, and any one or two interesting discoveries you made. Um, so why don't we start over here with y'all. Do you want to think of what? And then, and then, and then, and then, and then, we were looking at, um, so we were looking at um, Green Temple District 5. And um, it's a really interesting area. I'm sure he had to split them this top 50, basically, within the one couple that's a jet, every level of this place over us. Um, yeah. Just, so I just wanted to get board. Yeah, so you five, but it's fine. So you can board five. Yeah, like, right there. Uh, so you got to click and then switch on and just spin them out. Yeah. So if you zoom in, yeah, right, right. That would be. You basically you get to see every level, level of this point risk, and it's just saying that, yeah, if you zoom over, over it, oh, the lion's full. Yeah, sorry, give me one sec. No, cool. Go ahead. So you can see the CD outlines. Software functionality, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're looking at um this area, yeah. the DRM, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're also looking at push the north. Um, Very cool. So in, when you combine them both together, you start to see a nearly drop down. All is about. So really, what's, what factors are really jotting one for the eye displacement, like this is low displacement, but then you put Glendale and Jen put Twitter and, you know, all of the JSON that you tried to make it in like a fire discrepancy in terms of their displacement is. Right. Uh, which is fascinating. And how that relates to, you know, rent, renting fees, uh, rent and versus ownership, uh, and so forth, the all, all quite fascinating. Very cool. Yeah. No, that, that's super interesting. I think you're right. Like, that's kind of exactly what a tool like this can can help discover. That's a, that's a fantastic example. Um, very cool. Uh, why don't we move over here? Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, we look for an old Chinatown and old community district three and in home and happy um, and we were looking at the place of this for um, um, how that was like correlated to housing production. Uh -huh. uh, in the districts around it. So we looked at the housing production in CD3, which is like pretty low. I think it was like 5% increase on new uh, uh, buildings. Uh -huh. um, whereas like FIDI and Telsi, Farther and Farther, Phillips, all the districts around it had like 10 to 20% uh, more. Uh, more new buildings, um, because and it sense that that was driving by the market pressure uh, around uh, around Chinatown and bounds, particularly because such a low well number and all mm -hmm. all all rough rent stabilized and all um, low well, number of rent stabilized. Units, but high number of folks rented, mm -hmm. and so they were very vulnerable to that market. So yeah, very cool. Yeah, um, great. Uh, but y'all back there. So um, we worked at a double different unit because um, Malfi here works in Lewis Park, and so of course we're just looking at um, Morris Park that the need to data. Um, but we point out that I think we. Typically, went to just the centers. I'm sorry. Can you so, remind well, me well, where that is? Morris Park and Bowen. All right. Where are we at? That's Van Ness. A bit to the right. Here, this one. There we go. Beautiful. 
Yeah, it's just it's, it's interesting, interesting to know that like, you just want to go to visual data when you're doing quick you know, yeah. observation. Right. So then we transitioned into talking about um, displacement and comparing Morris Bart to Bedford, which I believe is here from close where you are, and just talking about that picture. The, the wanting to be able to compare the two because there's different stressors in both instances. And like Bedford's both to other communities that are experienced, that have experienced displacement, not being one. And yeah. Then, um, from nights who are having a little bit less of a rest, but looking at those two places just randomly, but you know, still looking at them because they're not the same. This place at rest, you know, that's different. Uh, they have different um, demographics and market pressures. So we just sort of like what could be other reasons for that displacement that he can he maybe see. Thinking, you know, using other metrics that aren't available here, obviously, but just yeah, thinking about maybe other. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I mean, it's something that's very interesting about this, the um, index that was built, this displacement risk analysis, that the individual metrics can be quite different, but putting them together holistically, you can get, you know, kind of similar levels of risk you know, for different reasons. Um, yeah, very cool. Um, and yeah, speaking of com comparisons is something that we've talked about and, and perhaps in the future in version 2.0, that will be uh, something we have. So um, we'll look forward to that at some unknown point in the future. Um, I want to jump to the next room here. Um, I think they have more suggestions than observations. Uh -huh. um, so first, we wanted to understand how you're defining uh, this place of risk and then try if it had anything to do with like things like eruption and poverty levels. That would make super cool. Um, and then we um, were also uh, trying to understand in the same exercise that you did with the area that you um, chose, only we chose plants for small wood and not wells in the bronze. And we tried to look at total population on uh, uh, household economic security. Under our household system on security, we saw in that. Okay. But while you're looking for that, I can answer your first question. Oh, uh, okay. so we we define displacement risk as the inability to remain in one's home very generically, um, and we prioritize. So displacement risk score has three subcategories: population vulnerability, housing conditions, and market pressure. Right. And we put um, central emphasis on population vulnerability and how housing conditions and market pressures might amplify or reduce population vulnerability. Um, so, like the actual like score mass calculation of like um, housing conditions plus market pressures multiplied by population vulnerability, and that's like on our data dictionary. So you don't have to remember that right now. But the idea we're putting special emphasis on population vulnerability, um, and each of those subcategories have different like indicators, but so the main idea, we did look at evictions when we were initially crafting this score as like, we, we treated the eviction data as a good parallel of like forced displacement of households being forced to move and compared the rates of evictions with our, um, at that point, very like interim math to see how close those like colors lined up. And they're a pretty good match. So I, we took that as a good sign that the indicators we picked were at least somewhat accurately reflecting um, where evictions are most commonly taking place in the city. Um, so that was what our, our process was in initially crafting the sleep and risk to score process. But I think, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I still intuitive seen that it should be part of the category. Yeah, I just don't know. Um, so it's not a part of one of the categories within the actual population, but we used it as like a test measure to see how accurate or reflective our displacement risk scores were. So like a benchmark. Yeah, like a benchmark. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then the second um, sort of conversation we had is how uh this might so if you're needing a a local law mandate in this process we appreciate that um but uh to a certain extent um i'm not sure if this mechanism is capturing my community voice so the developers telling me how their project aligns with um fair housing goals but you know does the community agree because Maybe um, that's an issue, but yeah, feed one of the problems about like um, as we look. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, we're all hoping they are such a new requirement um, to with grace. Um, now we're really hoping we're like interested to see how community board and other participants of the ULER, the uniform land use review procedure process, like are going to interact with the RERs and how they inform like their uh, evaluations of land use applications they found. So we're interested, it's like an evolving process, certainly. So we're definitely interested to see how people interact with them and say, get more and less, less, less of a new requirement. Um, great. Uh, next up on me. Share what y'all are looking at. Hi. Um, so we're looking at community board on onset pay. Um, in support of Team Stapleton and Yonder's Harbor Um, so the first thing we looked on there was housing affordability, quality, and security. And we looked at overcrowding, and we thought it was interesting that, um, between 2008 and 2012, it was a 5.9% percentage of overcrowding units on Shaw Island and between 2015 and 2019 there's a like a point one percent increase to six point zero. And if you look at under Hispanic um age and non-Hispanic, you can see that like um while there is like some question of reliability, um it almost doubles for Asian um non-Hispanics. Um and I guess like that's interesting because of that area of Sun Island is um has a lot more immigrants. So kind of just like the structure of immigrant families, we might um, assume them to be overcrowding where like those families tend to be like non-nuclear and not nuclear. Um and so like you know, um, Asians um and black not as many there's an, an increase of that as well as Hispanics. Um, we also looked at quality of life and access to opportunity. Um, and we looked at um, education, um, education access, access to broadband internet at home. And um, within Staten Island our neighborhood, 66% um, of people have broadband internet subscriptions, like the small population. But with, um, and with Asian and white um, Hispanics, it, um, it's above that average. But with black non-Hispanics, as well as Hispanics, that number is quite low. It's just a little bit over half. And I, it made us think about um, the outcomes of students during COVID when you had to be at home for um, school and how like that affects the quality of education they got then and how that affects their outcomes um, no, that's, that's. Yeah, absolutely. And that's such an interesting and meaningful, yeah, connection to make between the, these, these data points. Um, and I think reflecting on some of the statistical reliability of some of the, the other data you mentioned, I think ties back and to your point as well, a little bit about, you know, the data can only take us so far, whether it's reliable or whether there's some sort of statistical um, concern there as well. So I think it's, it's really interesting to also need to validate with community and qualitative uh, data and conversations like that as well. Um, I think we might be out of time, but do y'all want to do a quick, quick last one and then someone can go before we get cowbelled out of here. Um, we looked at flushing and same labor model, and I think similar to the previous group, we actually looked at, I think two things that's really interesting, which is the, um, the overburdened uh, percentage or how it progresses over time. I think one of our hypotheses or background knowledge knowing is like, oh, there's a lot of like land development and flushing. Like, how does that look in terms of effort and like, is there any, like, what does the data say and specifically for flushing? And I think we can see that's under, um, I think we didn't really look at it in terms of the map, it's like oh. a table. Yeah. Um, housing affordability and quality and security. And under that, in terms of 50%, that's housing. Um, I think if you go down there in rent up fifty percent or more severely rent burdened. And so over the time you can kind of see in the gray, and I'm sure that we have scroll past it. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um right here, yeah. Piece yeah. Of, a little higher. Yeah, 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 right oh, yeah. yeah. And so the fourteen point one percent is the overall total population. Mm -hmm. And then we kinda of also looked at what it means for Asian, non uh, black non Hispanic, the Saturday four, so on and so forth. So you can see Asian is 24% more than the average. And what we think that will also be not useful as a 
you ask feature and how do we like compare that kind of because this would be no theme out of as well. Mm-hmm. Like, is there any way for us to compare that easily? Um, because right now we're like, okay, that's 14% and then we remember it and we go to the other one and then we kind of toggle back and forth to see this nominal number versus percentage. Um, and then we also looked at in terms of what is, what does it mean over time in terms of overcrowdedness? Um, people per <coughs> room, um, and people in the same category and then try to look at, uh, the total population, as well as dividing by Asian, Black, and so on and so forth. So that's also yeah. really interesting to see the progression over the time. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah really interesting. Um, yes, another good, good feature that uh, we, have, we have talked about, but um, definitely sign up and send us, bug, bug us to, to include that in the end, we will. Um, all right. Yeah. Oh, so, sorry, I didn't mean to, didn't realize it. I skipped you back there. But we have some aware on what you did not be on your tool that is on the game, so you can fit enough of the heat. I'm sorry, and on work for you first. I already spent with one for the fun of your work, I stopped with video, and found with you without CL, thank you for the And we just saw the number, we're like, well, she won't know higher, lower the average, or like what the comparison is. Because I don't over time living in it, but they're just able to compare it. Not the utilizing it, but she quite know it's at the final of the post trial. Um, in a story along the water and place, you look at all the buttons. So, this is actually not like the ability to help an average eating bump against those new tables. How on the sea line of it? Yeah, that, that's a really good suggestion. Um, excellent. And you can also download all this data and play with it. Uh, and PDF and SL. Um, great. I think that's it. Sorry for keeping you a couple minutes over. Really appreciate um, your participation here. Thanks so much.